over and over again. That's like a type. But I also find it interesting now. thinking oh no hi mal i just want to say hi i can't say not a problem if you do get the chance to come back later yo you know what's so funny is we were gonna raid you yesterday and you were gone for like ever and i was just like yelling at you at the end of stream yesterday i was like come back <laughs> oh man uh but yeah I, I hope you have a wonderful day no no no, it's totally okay rowie i i understand you strippers 16 hours i didn't even notice i didn't even look um holy it's shit man. Break. <laughs> you definitely deserve that break yeah yeah no for sure that's totally fine it was just funny um but yeah go and do your thing sleep or work or whatever it is that you need to do after that huge long stream yesterday uh, and I hope you have a wonderful day. If I don't see you again later, Pagare! Good morning! Ah, snap. Ah, snap. Yo, good heckin' morning. Hold on, let me switch streams over. Um. Whew. Hmm. <clears throat> Let's do more of the tutorial today. So, let's take a look at what we got. My game is really, I'm pretty pumped. I got the analog working the way I want. Um, there's a meta progression and a transition effect that I want to add to this game from the tutorial. Oh, my controller's not plugged in. I was like, it's broken! for a second.
we don't want to save it here. We want to feel while we're navigating through our UI, there are some abrupt changes between scenes that we want to resolve. And the way that we're going to do this is we're going to use a screen transition. And the screen transition is essentially what you see in a lot of games where there will be like a screen wipe that comes over the screen and then that will transition into a new scene. And that's what we're gonna do because that will mask the abrupt changes between our different scenes and just generally make the game feel a lot more solid. So I've attached a texture to this lesson as a resource. It's called screen transition.png. So go ahead and grab that, download it and bring it on in to your file system in Godot. And you can drag that screen transition into the assets UI directory. All right, let's create a new scene with a root type of canvas layer. Let's add a color rectangle as our root node or as our first child node. Let's rename this to screen transition. And let's make the color rectangle the full size by changing the anchor preset to full rect from this. Okay, so we got to create a new scene. The screen, I'm, uh, he's going to do other node, canvas layer looks like. Let's just restart the video just so I know I'm not missing anything. Attached a texture to this lesson as a resource. It's called screen transition. Hold on, I got to check my phone. I'll be right back.
Oh wow, still nobody came by. Okay. Um, so we're gonna do a canvas layer. Play some musics. PNG. So go ahead and grab that. Download. bring it on in to your file system in Godot. And you can drag that screen transition into the assets UI directory. All right, let's create a new scene with a root type of canvas layer. Let's add a color rectangle as our root node or as our first child node. Let's rename this to screen transition. And let's make the color rectangle the full size by changing. The anchor preset to full rect from this button up here in the toolbar. All right, let's save this in scenes UI and screen transition is fine. Actually, we don't want to save it here. We want to save it in auto load because this is going to be something that. That's available to us all. with a root type of canvas layer. Let's add a color rectangle as our root node or as our first child node. Let's rename this to screen transition. And let's make the color rectangle the full size by changing the anchor preset to full rect from this button up here in the toolbar. All right, let's save this in scenes UI and screen transition is fine. Actually, we don't want to save it here. We want to save it in auto load because this is going to be something that's available to us all the time. So let's go ahead and save that in auto load. All right, so we've got our screen transition. Now we're going to write a shader that will do the transition effect. So select the color rectangle, come on down to the material section, which is near the bottom and select the empty drop down and then new shader material. And then in our shader material here, select the shader resource. Of course, create new shader and just click create when this window comes up and then click into the shader to bring up the shader editor. Now the defaults here are good we want to define it uniform though, so we're going to say uniform sampler 2D, and this is going to be called transition texture. You can just save it in. In our shader material here, select the shader resource, create new shader, and just click create when this window comes up, and then click into the shader to bring up the shader editor. Now the defaults here are good. 
We want to define it uniform though, so we're going to say uniform sampler 2D, and this is going to be called transition texture, and then put a semicolon at the end. All right, so we've got the shader parameter now, transition texture. Go ahead and grab that screen transition.png and drag it on over. So now that's set as one of... put a semicolon at the end. All right, so we've got the shader parameter now. Transition texture. Go ahead and grab that screen transition.png and drag it on over. So now that's set as one of our shader parameters here. All right, and what do we want to do in our fragment shader? Well, what we want to do in the fragment shader is essentially animate this transition over time such that the color rectangle is covering something on screen in accordance with how far we are through the transition. So let's create another uniform. And we're going to call this uniform float let's just call it percent and then let's do colon hint range 0, 0.0 to 1.0 and then don't forget a semicolon at the end and so now we've got this percent parameter here so essentially what we're going to do is this is a grayscale texture this transition texture so we're going to compare the texture let's say red channel to the percent value and depending on the value of the red channel compared to the percent, we're either going to render the pixel or not. Now, why are we using the red channel? Well, in a grayscale texture, the RGB channels all have the same value. So essentially, we're just using the texture to encode some data, and it doesn't really matter what channel we use. We could use R or G or B. Uh, the only one we can't use is alpha because the alpha is always one. So what we're gonna do is we are going to grab the color of the transition texture at the current UV. So we'll say vec4 transition color is equal to, we're gonna use the texture function. We're gonna pass our transition texture into that. And then our UV is gonna be the UV that's coming in for this texture. And then we need a semicolon at the end. So that's grabbing a color from our texture at the same UV as the pixel that we're considering in the color rect for the fragment shader. Again, remember the fragment shader runs for every pixel in a texture. We're essentially getting the corresponding pixel at the transition texture. Now, it's not technically the corresponding pixel because UV coordinates are on a zero to one basis and our transition texture is 256 by 256 and our color rectangle is actually wider and has a different aspect ratio. So it's getting the color of the texture at the UV that corresponds to the UV of the current fragment that we're looking at. Okay, so this will make more sense as we get into it. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say if and then in parentheses, transition color dot R is less than percent. Then we're going to use curly braces because that's what the shader language uses for blocks. Then we're going to say color dot A is equal to zero with a colon at the end. Else, and then in the else block, we want to write color is equal to texture then the constant texture and the constant UV. So we're essentially saying, just use the, co the color of the color rectangle if this is not the case. So now if I move the percent, you can see that we get something really nice looking here. So as we move the percent, it shrinks in and out. Now, when you play with this percent, you'll notice that the edges are very strange. They look kind of bubbly and just not right. And that's because the default filtering that's applied to the texture 
is I believe linear. I could be wrong on the exact filtering, but basically there's different ways of filtering a texture so that you can infer what data is between two pixels. So for instance, if you take a small image and you upscale it, the filtering that you use on that image determines how much new data is created for that image. And with pixel art, we actually don't want any filtering to do. I think we it don't, sucks. We don't want our pixel art to look blurry nice. when we upscale it. We want it to look really sharp. And that's the same instance in here. We don't want Godot to infer what data exists when this texture gets stretched. We want it to use the raw pixel data. And so what we need to do in the Uniform Sampler 2D here our transition texture, we need to add a colon just before the semicolon here, and we need to specify filter nearest to tell it to use nearest filtering, aka preserve pixels, and let's do this now. So now you can see that we get this nice pixelated edge. Now the dithering or the sort of dots, the empty dots here along the edge are due to the way that I built the texture, but this should actually be just fine. It kind of gives it a retro look. So we're gonna go, we're gonna say that this is fine. And one thing that we need to do is we actually need to invert the... Something is wrong here. I missed something along here. To zero with a colon at the end. Else, less than color percent. Color A. That's right. Vec4 UV. This is all right. Transition color equals texture. Transition is texture. If transition color dot R is less than percent. Oh wait, I see something. No, I don't see anything. Never mind, just joking. And then in the else block, we want to write color is equal to texture, then the constant texture and the constant UV. So we're essentially saying, just use the, co the color of the color rectangle if this is not. What is going on here? Unknown identifier and expression percent. Maybe this is outdated code. Percent. Color transition color dot R percent. Maybe something up the ladder is wrong. High hint range, uniform float. Oh, there it is, there it is. Okay. Beautiful. Cool. Got it. I missed the T. I've been obsessed with making this game, it's like, pretty awesome, but I've been neglecting my health and my cleanliness. Not the case. So now if I move the percent, you can see that we get something really nice looking here. So as we move the percent, it shrinks in and out. Now when you play very with cool. this percent, you'll notice that the edges are very strange. They look kind of bubbly and just not right. And that's because the default filtering that's applied to the texture is I believe linear. I could be wrong on the exact filtering, but basically there's different ways of filtering a texture so that you can infer what data 
is between two pixels. So for instance, if you take a small image and you upscale it, the filtering that you use on that image determines how much new data is created for that image. And with pixel art, we actually don't want any filtering to do. We don't, we don't want our pixel art to look blurry when we upscale it. We want it to look really sharp. And that's the same instance in here. We don't want Godot to infer what data exists when this texture gets stretched. We wanted to use the raw pixel data. And so what we need to do in the uniform sampler 2D here, our transition texture, we need to add a colon just before the semicolon here, and we need to specify filter nearest to tell it to use nearest filtering, AKA preserve pixels, and let's do this now. So now you can see that we get this nice pixelated edge. Now the dithering or the sort of dots, the empty dots here along the edge are due to the way that I built the texture, but this should actually be just fine. It kind of gives it a retro look. So we're gonna go, we're gonna say that this is fine. And one thing that we need to do is we actually need to invert the if statement. So instead of transition color dot R is less than percent, let's do greater than percent. And that inverts it the other way. So you can imagine we'll start at zero for our transition. We'll go all the way to one for the transition and then we'll come back out for the transition back. Now, the thing about applying a shader to a color rectangle is that you will notice that when you change the color of the color rect, that color is not transferred to the shader. And admittedly, I don't know exactly why this is, but we can very easily fix this. So in addition to our transition texture, let's create a new uniform. And this is going- Hey Monkey King, I'm doing my screen transitions. Look, it's gonna be like Is that gonna be cool? It's going to be a VEC4 and we'll call it transition color. Bro, I've been going way too hard on this game, dude. I don't know what's wrong with me. <laughs> like I've been looking at my house. My house is a freaking wreck right now. There's like clothes and blankets everywhere. I'm just done, I'm ignoring it. Color. And we'll- I streamed 16 hours yesterday, plus. We'll say- With breaks, but still. Colon. And then the colon, after the colon, we're gonna say source color. Now that invalidates our variable down here, this VEC4. So we're gonna call this transition texture color and rename it here as well. Dude, I, I don't know what this is, but I'm pretty sure the shaders are written in like a JavaScript type of thing. Yeah, I'm gonna pimp it out a little bit more too. My whole UI, I'm gonna spend a lot more time. That's gonna be like the last thing I do because I wanna get, um, I wanna get the game like working so people can play it and then I'll do it. Then I'll clean up the user interface after the fact, but I want the user interface to be really like retro, kind of like StarCraft or somewhere between like StarCraft or, um, you know, like Mega Man somewhere in that realm. And when I say StarCraft, I mean StarCraft 1, the original. <clears throat> I give it that real kind of sp retro space vibe, you know? I want I want all the 40 year olds to poop their pants when they play. And then the kids don't even know, but they'll still think it's cool. in DirectX or OpenGL or other graphics. Yeah, it's, it, this, everything in here now could be JavaScript, um, which is interesting. It's, I don't think it is JavaScript. I think it's some kind of shader language. The file is called, uh, where's my auto loads? The thing I like about you, Monkey King, is you're like, um, you have a lot of versatility, so it's like, and I do too, um, uh, but you like, you don't have to just talk about Unity or RPG Maker, you can kind of cross over pretty cool, which is nice. <clears throat> like you can see what I'm doing in Godot and you could easily translate some of the concepts over to Unity or if you wanted to do Godot later you could, you know. 
uses shading language similar to GL, SL, ES. Three on most data types and functions are supported. The few remaining ones will likely be added over time. GL, GLSL. So GLSL is very similar in syntax to JavaScript, apparently, right? Because it looks similar. Um, like, I feel like this is like a web page. <laughs> this is like something I do in a web page in a JS file. GD script has made me better at coding because I've learned more. Um, it's forced me to learn more about the logic than the syntax. Like I don't. I think at this stage in my as a programmer, it's like I'm more focused on logic. Syntax is just something you have to find. You know, it's like a dictionary. You have to look it up when you don't know it. But it's if you have the logic, you have you know all the capabilities. You know, so it's not so much like a, like programming is not like a memorization skill. It's it's much more a logic skill, and I think uh, programming makes you go faster. But if you can always look up the things, I mean, memorization makes you go faster. But you can always you'll if you have good logic, you're much less likely to get stuck. Just can about video game development and all aspects of it, yeah. You know, it's interesting for me, I did a lot of uh, web development, but I am also have a lot of experience in marketing <clears throat> and uh, design. Like, I've designed labels and stuff for, like, Rockstar. I, I made a box for them, a bunch of food companies. Uh, so I have, like, a design background, sort of. I mean, I don't do that anymore, but I... You see it in like my UI and stuff. Like even with Familia, I'm very frustrated with the way the UI is, and it's just because of the limitations behind the engine. And I've I've done more than most, um, but now that I have Godot, it's like the UI stuff is just so easy, you know, and it's very exciting. Um, I am, in a way, I think the UI is the most exciting part for me to do, um, and it's like I'm saving the best for last. The UI I have in now is basically just me learning how to do it in the through the tutorial, and then later on I I'm gonna really go hard on it, which I'm really pumped about. Like I really want to do that, but I want to get all the other features in first because the UI will not so much affect. And and tell me if I'm right about this, but the user interface doesn't really um, affect. It's not as necessary to, to have people test and debug it. You know, like, I can finish the UI while everybody's, like, trying it and finding bugs and balancing and stuff like that. You know what I mean? Um, at least that's my thought process. So then when I finally do, like, a... I don't know how I'm going to release it. It probably won't be much of a event, but... Um, yeah. But yeah, it's been um this whole Godot thing is just really a blast and I feel so competent as a programmer um using it, you know? Like I don't like I know I'm not the best programmer, uh but I feel like so much more competent than I've ever felt. And I feel like anything I want to do, I can do it, you know? It's just a matter of putting the time in. <laughs> This, this freaking, this tutorial was super good because it talked a lot about structuring your project and I think it was exactly what I needed because that was the main thing I was kind of a little bit, I don't know how to work in Godot or even Unity. It's like, how do you structure all your objects or in my case nodes? It's like kind of daunting, you know, um, but I feel a lot more confident in my structure because this tutorial is so good, he's kind of showed me a good way to think think about it, you know? Think about how to, to place things and where to put things and how much content to put in each script and how much content to put in each node. Um, like one of the things I think I didn't really know in an integrated way that this tutorial really stresses is he says every node should only do one thing. 
you know? And I think, like, on a philosophical level, that's, like, awesome. Um, if you can make it so every single node or object does one thing in your game, like, you're going to really um, have a very organized project, you know? So everything that it does, you should be able... Like, every node, you should be able to describe what it does in one sentence. For example, like... If we look at my title screen, right? I have an animation player. It makes an animation. It's a camera. A music player. Uh, these are just images. But let's go into um, scene transition, right? I have the color rect, which is the background. The scene transition. I don't know. It's just like everything does one thing. And I think what I would do in the past is I would get one node or one object and I'd make it do like 20 things. And then when you're trying to work on a project like that, like just the the way to comprehend it is very difficult, you know? Yeah, these tutorials have great practices. And he also, I mean, like, he kind of makes me want to make a tutorial. I thought about making an RPG Maker MZ tutorial, and I think I probably still will on Unity. And it's good because in my channel, I don't really want to talk about fundamentals, right? Like, I don't want to talk about the really basic stuff. I don't know if it's like this for you. Yeah, these tutorials are Udemy, Udemy tutorials. So it's like I'm kind of sharing like a premium tutorial, but whatever. <laughs> I'm not like really showing it to you. If anything, I'm promoting it, so. I get him some sales. <laughs> like I'm, I have it in the other screen and I'm watching it while he talks. I think, I think if I were him, I would not mind. So hopefully he doesn't like try to sue me or something. It's not like I'm making money off of it. Maybe a little bit in subs, but not really. Anyway, let's get back to this. Title screen. Wait, no. GD Shader is the name of the file. Where did he put this? I gotta figure that out later. Where did he put his GD Shader file? So it's under auto load, I think. So scenes. Auto load. Here it is. For MZ or MZ. Yeah. How? I mean, it would take like a. F it would probably take like easily like two three hundred hours to do so it's not like a minor task right this course has been very successful he sold like ten thousand um copies of it at seventeen dollars or whatever so he's made like a you know a year's income off of it um but he's on the very successful side of tutorials he wrote this right at the beginning of godot 4's release so he was ready because he was doing it and then he had like the whole course ready probably by the time Godot 4 launched and then he went back and all the things that changed on the last push he went back and <clears throat> updated yeah exactly so Udemy courses I feel are for beginners YouTube is more like very high-end stuff and that's how I think I'm going to structure my channel as well because a lot of people want and that's how I have structured my channel my stuff on on RPG maker is all pretty advanced like it's not beginner stuff so um, I try to be simple and straightforward about it but it's none of that would be considered like fundamentals Yeah. Did they have good reviews? And why were they crap? I'm just curious. Like, why were they well-reviewed, but they were still crap? Like, I really... They were, like, three to four stars. Let's look at this course, how it rates. Because this course is a good fucking course, too.
So this one is 4.8 stars with 442 ratings and 5,000. Wow, he get, he sold a bunch. When I bought this course, it had less than 4,000. So this this course is really like gone viral. Yeah, so this one is 4.8. So I think that is something you can look at. Everybody who took this course feels like it was very good. I gave it five stars. And then you can watch some of the, the, the classes too, right? I think the issue mainly they were YouTubers who just YouTubed what they were teaching so they would have a strong understanding of what they were teaching. Yes. With this guy, with Firebelly Games, it's very clear that he's a programmer, right? Like he sold, uh, he's, he has almost 1900, 19,000 students and over two courses. His other course is a Godot course too, which I'm probably gonna take, honestly. I'll do it faster, but. Oh no, no, yeah, there's a difference between a content creator and a programmer. I would say as far as streamers go, like, um, I'm more of a developer than a content creator. You know what I mean? Like, and you can be both, but they're definitely different jobs that have a totally different set of skills. So somebody who's successful on YouTube and makes good videos isn't necessarily a good programmer at all. 100%. And vice versa. Somebody who's a good programmer isn't necessarily making good videos. The thing with Udemy, though, is the production style is so, like, instructional, you know? It's so much more formal that you don't have to be, like, all entertaining. I think intermediate and advanced are very difficult to teach. Yeah, this course is considered intermediate. So it's like, here's his other course, and this one has 4.7. And he's has 1,400 students. So the his other course, he sold like three times as much. I think this one is Godot 3 though, so it's older, right? So basically what he did is he recreated uh, his tutorial for Godot 4 in a different style. This one's 2D platformer. So the new one like kind of... Like for me, even if I could sell a hundred courses, it would be worth like almost a month, you know? But I feel like I could do something comparable in quality to this one. Yeah, this, I think this course is considered, um, it's considered, uh, the course that I'm doing is considered intermediate. Where do you see that? So, so some programming knowledge is the requirement. going with this okay and then instead of so let me just catch up with this code here back for transition color equals texture transition color UV then he does an if transition color is greater than per transition texture color oh I see transition Texture color dot R is greater than percent. Color dot 
this texture. I'm missing something. That color is not, not transferred to the shader. And admittedly, I don't know exactly why this is, but we can very easily fix this. So in addition to our transition texture, let's create a new uniform. And this is going to be a VEC4, and we'll call it transition color. And we'll say colon, and then the colon, after the colon, we're gonna say source color. Now that invalidates our variable down here, this VEC4. So we're gonna call this transition texture color and rename it here as well. Okay, and then instead of sampling the texture down here in this else block, we're simply going to say the color is equal to the transition color. Okay, and that's black by default. And so now if we go down to our shader parameters, we can change this transition color to that brown that we use throughout the game, just like that. I don't use the brown. And that brown. I'm not a weirdo. I'm gonna use a dark gray. Give this course two stars. Let's see it. Welcome to Learn Swift with Bao, the intermediate to advanced Swift course. Four pillars of the Swift programming language object oriented protocol or in programming protocol. Before I make this course, I what happens is, do you know what goes underneath the hood Ford, my lesson. Yeah, he's totally like a YouTuber. I'm sure that got him a lot of credibility in some people's eyes. Dude, this one has 17.5 hours of video. The one I'm doing has way more than that. Oh no, it's only 17 hours. Holy shit. It took me like three weeks to do this course. Jesus, 17 hours really gets you a lot. Brown hex code is three. I would like to make like a more staticky background, but we'll figure that out later. Three F two six three one in case you don't have it saved. And so now we've got a nice looking transition texture that we can use. Now we need to animate this. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to add an animation player to the root node here and I'll move it as the first child. Let's create a new animation and let's call this default. Let's make the duration 0.4 seconds like usual and let's select our color rectangle. Let's select the animation tab at the bottom and then let's scroll down to our shader parameters and let's keyframe this percent right here. So click on the oh, key button so next easy. to the percent shader parameter this is crazy. and click create. And then at the end, let's set the percent to one. So insert a key at the end and change the value to one. And so now if you play it, you should see that. Okay, so let's go to color rect, percent, keyframe, create. Another keyframe and there we go. Easy. 
let's create an easing value for this. So I'm going to select the first keyframe and make a professional who runs their own boot camp. I would love to do some local boot camps. So this course is good. Hello, and welcome to the world's best iOS development course. My name is Angela, and I'm fully fledged iOS apps. With full module, then I will be programming concepts as well as access to our. Now, as if all of that wasn't enough, my iOS courses are the highest rated in Udemy history, and this iOS course is going to be even better. At 55 plus hours, this is my. Holy shit. She's a doctor? What is her doctorate in? Some people, man. Sixty hours. This like almost makes me mad. This person is too amazing. Like I'm in, I'm feeling intimidated right now. With the 4.7, interestingly enough, even with all those reviews, still less of a percentage than the guy I, I, uh, the, the, the course that I'm taking. Everybody loves that course. I think what'll happen is over time, the rating will drop because he was like the first. With Godot being such like a desert in documentation, it's like, it's like you don't really, you know, you don't have anything else. So like this tutorial is like the best thing I've seen. So that's, par that's part of what uh, makes the ratings good, I think, because there's like no other sources of information on this stuff. Make the easing closer to two. And that just looks much nicer. And you can play the animation backwards, by the way, with this button right here, this play backwards button. And that's how we're gonna be using it in engine. So we're gonna be playing it and then going back. All right, so that's looking good. Let's create a script for our screen transition here. And let's create. And we're going to want to do one thing that's special here, which is that we're gonna create a signal transition halfway. That's going to tell other parts of the code that the transition has fully covered the screen so that we can do things in the background. And you'll see how that works in just a second. So oh, shit, we've got our transition halfway. Right back. Now let's... I don't know if you can tell, but uh, I'm slightly allergic to cats. The, by the way, I grabbed the cat. I'm like at arm's length. <laughs> I have to like, I had to go like wash my hands and stuff.
the worst thing that can happen is the cat gets its dander everywhere inside. I have to like clean the whole house. I guess that's something I should do anyway, but. I wish I wasn't allergic to the cat. I like cats. Okay, um, back to work. Let's create a method called funk transition in. And what we'll do is we'll call animation player dot play default. Actually, let's rename this to transition. So it's just function transition. And then let's create another method here called funk emit transitioned halfway. And then in here, we're simply going to do transition halfway dot emit. And the reason that we're creating a new function for this is because we're going to call it in the animation player. So let's create a call method track in our animation. So open up that animation. It's interesting that he doesn't want to use a tween to do this. I wonder why. This seems more like a tween type of thing to me, but whatever. I guess you already have the animation player. That the transition has fully covered the screen so that we can do things in the background. And you'll see how that works in just a second. So we've got our transitioned halfway. Now let's let's create a method called funk transition in. And what we'll do is we'll call animation player dot play default. Actually, let's rename this to transition. So it's just function transition. And then let's create another method here called funk emit transitioned halfway. And then in here, we're simply going to do transition halfway dot emit. And the reason that we're creating a new function for this is because we're going to call it in the animation player. So let's create a call method track in our animation. So open up that animation. Panel here, click add track, call method track. Double click the root node screen transition and then Go ahead and insert a key, which is emit transitioned halfway and drag that on over so that it's at the end. So now when it gets to the end, which is fully covered, it's going to emit that signal, which again will let us know that we can now switch out the what scene because this say what here, type of click add track, call method track, double click the root node screen transition, and then and what go ahead and insert use? a key, which is emit transitioned halfway and drag that on over so that it's at the end. So now when it gets to the end, which is fully covered, it's going to emit that signal, which again will let us know that we can now switch out the scene because this is going How to be on get top. There? So let's create a call method track in our animation. So open up that animation panel here, click add track, call method track, double click the root node screen transition, and then go ahead and insert a key, which is emit transitioned halfway and drag that on over so that it's it screen transition. And then go ahead and insert a key, which is emit. I don't see it. I don't see it. Emit transitioned halfway. He has it and I don't. Emit. I can just do it manually. Emit. And ish. And halfway. It transitioned halfway and drag that on over so that it's at the end. So now when it that was weird, it didn't auto um, bring it up for me. It gets to the end, which is fully covered. I don't know why. It's going to emit that signal, which again will let us know that we can now switch out the scene because this is going to be on top of the window. 
Now, there's something tricky here, which is that Ooh, something that tricky. signal is going to be emitted again when we play it backwards. And when are we going to play it backwards? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to await in here. We're going to await transitioned halfway, just like so. And then we're going to call animation player dot play backwards default. So it's going to play default, oh, there's a play await backwards for that function? transition signal to be sent, and then it's going to play that animation backwards. One problem we have when we call play backwards is that it's also going to emit this transition halfway signal again because that's happening at the end of the animation and that's not exactly what we want to do. So the way that we can fix that is we can simply do the following. We can create a new variable called skip emit and we'll set that to false. Then in our emit transition halfway, we'll say if skip emit, yeah, we can set skip emit to false in here, and then we can return. So if skip emit equals false. Oh, if skip emit, then skip emit equals false. We'll await the transition halfway, and then when that transition is done, we can say skip emit here equals true. And then when this play backwards happens, it's going to get to this block, see that skip emit is true. It's gonna reset it, but it's also gonna return so we don't so we don't have that transition halfway happening again. So essentially we're just This is basically what I did for my control controller. ignoring the second transitioned halfway signal emission. So with all of that out of the way, now we need to add this as an auto load. But before we do, let's select the root node here and let's set the layer here to something like five so that it renders on top of everything else. And now let's go to project, project settings, auto load. Let's go ahead and load up that scenes, auto load, screen transition dot TSCN. Go ahead and add that. So now our screen transition is an auto load node, and I'm gonna show you how we can use this. So I'm gonna go open my main menu script here. And so in here, in our on play press, we can do screen transition dot transition. So we can call that, which will kick off the transition. Then we'll await screen transition dot transition halfway. So we're gonna wait for that to be done. And then we can change our scene to the file. So now if I run my game and I click play, that's not going to work because let's go back to our screen transition. We got hit by the control node mouse filter. So we need to, it's not going to work because because let's go back to our screen transition. We got, got hit by the control node mouse filter. So we need to go to our screen transition, go to the color rectangle here, and we need to change the mouse filter mode to ignore. Now, it may actually be beneficial to introduce the mouse blocking capabilities of the transition because then that means that we can't do any input while a transition is happening, which may actually be a good thing. So let's leave the mouse filter in place and what we'll do in our animation player is we'll simply set the color rectangle to invisible by default. So let's click this off as visible, so that's now invisible, and when a control node is not visible, it does not accept any mouse events. So we can mark that as invisible with the little eye icon like we did. With our color rectangle selected, open up the animation panel at the bottom. I kind of don't like the way he's doing that. I would rather you turn the control back on and then turn it off. And then let's scroll down until His we see eyes getting the visibility like option, so... which is about midway through. I don't have that up, man. Stream avatars is kind of broken. So we've got the visible here. Let's keyframe that by clicking the key icon. 
click create. And so we've got this visible here. Now remember, we're playing this animation backwards too. So what I'm gonna do is at 0 0.01 seconds, I'm gonna change my snap to 0 0.01 and I'm gonna zoom in until I see that 0 0.01 marker. I'm gonna mark it as visible right here. And so do you see what this is doing? Basically, this will set it to invisible and then- Okay, I see what you're doing there. Add track off. He's doing the visible marker. I'd rather do an on ready invisible. I feel like it's more solid. I don't want to do it the way he's doing it. At least not exactly. Because the on ready, it's like, it doesn't matter what the hell you do here. Like this is the kind of thing you'll accidentally leave off or on during your update. You know what I mean? Like at least I will. I don't know if other people won't, but I'd rather set it up so regardless of what this is doing, it'll still work correctly. So what we're gonna do, um, I'll set the invisible in the animation. That's fine. Uh, but I don't want to do the color rec, the screen transition exactly like that. So we'll set this key here. And he did it at 0 0.01 seconds. Turn the search off. So turn the value off and we'll do it at, what was he, 0 0.01? Yeah, 0 0.01 and then we'll put it there. So that turns the value off. But what I'm gonna do Actually, you do have to turn it back on. No. No, this will work. So I can just um on ready, which I th I think this is a better way to do it. Uh funk on ready. And we'll do uh, screen transition self, how about self dot visible equals true. Now that is a much better way to handle it because now, no matter what I do with this, it'll still work. And after a 0 0.01 second, it'll be visible. And the reason for that is because when we come back around, we're going to want to set it to invisible again so mouse input can happen. If we only had a single keyframe... Oh wait, I'm doing it wrong. So this value should be on and this should be false. Okay. Here, setting it to visible, um, then we wouldn't be able to toggle it back to invisible. So that's the purpose of these two keyframes and this will be not noticeable, so it should be fine. So now when we go back to our main, we should be Let's see if my way works. Be able to screen transition doesn't exist. layer. What's going on here? Okay, transition, skip emit. It's in the screen transition.gd, which is where I am. And let's set the layer here to something like five so that it renders on top of everything else. And now let's go to project, project settings, auto load. Let's go ahead and load up that scenes, auto load, screen transition .tscn. Go ahead and add that. So now our screen transition is an auto load node. Do screen. 
So we can call that, Here, which- wait, oh, Let's see where it broke. Screen transition. So now it's in the, oh, this is the code in the title screen. Okay. It'll kick off. So I missed something here. Let's find it. the main menu stuff oh, here we are menu here and I'm gonna close the output window and basically what we want to do is copy these two lines and paste scene transition transition is not there I'm gonna have to use the bathroom I'll be right back Non-existent transition in base canvas layer. Them. Okay, so it's not in the screen transition. Right. I'll be right back, I gotta use the bathroom. Okay. Alrighty. Oh, that's it right there. Don't work. What did debugger say? Emit transitioned halfway. Invalid method call. Fuck. I think this is outdated. Oh, they misspelled again. Can you? 
boost this. Let's remove those obnoxious um, prints from the player scene. It's like running, I can feel it. So it, at one it goes on. On ready, the self visible is false. Okay, I'm just gonna do it the way he did it. My on ready is not working. So turn the visible off. Transition signal to be sent, and then it's going to play. And we'll the CN. Go ahead and do <coughs> that. So now our screen trans off the transition. Then we'll await screen transition dot transition. Now, if I run my game to ignore, so let's click this off color rectangle selected ability option, which is at 0 0.01 seconds. I'm going to change my snap to 0 0.01, and I'm going to zoom in. until I see that 0 0.01 marker, I'm gonna mark it as visible right here. And so do you see what this is doing? Basically, this will set it to invisible, and then after a 0 0.01 second, it'll be visible. And the reason for that is because when we come back around, we're going to want to set it to invisible again so mouse input can happen. If we only had a single keyframe here, setting it to visible, um, then we wouldn't be able to toggle it back to invisible. So that's the purpose of these two keyframes, and this will be not. Oh, I see what I did wrong. The color rect is on the visible. Okay, so trash this. Color rect, we're gonna add. player to color act visible key Was envisioning the whole thing, which doesn't work. Value on. Works.
not noticeable, so it should be fine. So now when we go back to our main, we should be able to click on play and we'll get a nice transition like that. Now there are a couple of other places where we'll want to introduce that transition. My transition doesn't look as clean as his. jumps right back into the game. One of the places we need to transition as well is to the options menu. So let's go to our main menu here and I'm going to close the output window. And basically what we want to do is copy these two lines and paste them right above the rest of our code in the on options pressed. Okay. And then let's go to our pause menu as well and let's do the same thing. So open up the pause menu script. When the options button is pressed, let's just paste those two lines again. So screen transition dot transition, and then we'll await that transition halfway. And let's see if that works. So we're going to go ahead and open up our game. Let's click options. That takes us to the options. We need to do the same for the back button, but let's go ahead and play, open up the pause menu, click options. Okay. So options isn't working. And why is that? So I want you to think brainstorm for a bit. Why do you think that this options is not working? Okay, and the answer is because we did not change the process mode of the screen transition, so it is being affected by the pause state of the scene tree. So we need to just scroll down with the screen transition root node selected and change the process mode to always. Okay, and then while we're here, let's open up the options menu and let's paste those two lines above on the on back some transitions. Let's go.
That takes us to the options. We need to do the same for the back button, but let's go ahead and play, open up the pause menu, click options. Okay, so options isn't working, and why is that? So I want you to think, brainstorm for a bit, why do you think that this options is not working? Okay, and the answer is because we did not change the process mode of the screen transition, so it is being affected by the pause state of the scene tree. So we need to just scroll down with the screen transition root node selected and change the process mode to always. project settings, auto load, and I'm gonna show you how we can run. And then we can change our scene to the file. So now if I run my game and I click play, that's not gonna work because, let's go back to our screen transition, we got hit by the control node mouse filter. So we need to go to our screen transition, go to the color rectangle here, and we need to change the mouse filter mode to ignore. Now, it may actually be beneficial to introduce the mouse blocking capabilities of the transition because then that means that we can't do any input while a transition is happening, which may actually be a good thing. So let's leave the mouse filter in place and what we'll do in our animation player is we'll simply set the color rectangle to invisible by default. So let's click this off as visible, so that's now invisible, and when a control node is not visible, it does not accept any mouse events. So we can mark that as invisible with the little eye icon like we did. With our color rectangle selected, open up the animation panel at the bottom. And then let's scroll down until we see the visibility option, which is about midway up the animation panel at the bottom. 
and a control node is not visible or in place. And what we'll do is all broken dude So the second one, it doesn't, the emit like doesn't work for some reason. Transitioned halfway. So it just grabs it after it loads it halfway. It's always a thing where after the transition runs multiple times, it always breaks. So runs the animation transition then it waits till it's halfway then it skips then it hits the skip emit um, then 
returns the skip emit to true. And then this goes in between there after it's transitioned halfway. So it turns it to false. Then it transitions halfway, it tells it back. Hmm. I'm missing something. There's something funky going on here. Oh, to turn that off. That's all it is. Maybe not. So I think the color rect is getting turned on but not off or something. doesn't emit the second time. I feel like this should be here. transition it's auto loaded direct off right All that, which will kick off the transition, then we'll await screen transition dot transitioned halfway. So we're going to wait for that to be done, and then we can change our scene to the file. So now if I run my game and I click play, that's not going to work because Let's go back to our screen transition. We got hit by the control node mouse filter. So we need to go to our screen transition, go to the color rectangle here, and we need to change the mouse filter mode to ignore. Now, it may actually be beneficial to introduce the mouse blocking capabilities of the transition, because then that means that we can't do any input while a transition is happening, which may actually be a good thing. So let's leave the mouse filter in place, and what we'll do in our animation player is we'll simply set the color rectangle to invisible by default. So let's click this off as visible, so that's now invisible, and when a control node is not visible, it does not accept any mouse event. So 
So we can mark that as invisible with the little eye icon like we did. With our color rectangle selected, open up the animation panel at the bottom. And then let's scroll down until we see the visibility option, which is about midway through. So we've got the visible here. Let's keyframe that by clicking the key icon, click create. And so we've got this visible here. Now remember, we're playing this animation backwards too. So what I'm gonna do is at 0 0.01 seconds, I'm gonna change my snap to 0 0.01 and I'm gonna zoom in until I see the 0 0.01 marker. I'm gonna mark it as visible right here. And so do you see what this is doing? Basically, this will set it to invisible, and then after a 0 0.01 second, it'll be visible. And the reason for that is because when we come back around, we're going to want to set it to invisible again so mouse input can happen. If we only had a single keyframe here, setting it to visible, um, then we wouldn't be able to toggle it back to invisible. So that's the purpose of these two keyframes, and this will be not noticeable, so it should be fine. So now when we go back to our main, we should be able to click on play, and we'll get a nice transition like that. Now there are a couple of other places where we'll want to introduce that transition. One of the places we need to transition as well is to the options menu. So let's go to our main menu here, and I'm gonna close the output window. And basically what we wanna do is copy these two lines and paste them right above the rest of our code in the on options pressed. Okay, and then let's go to our pause menu as well. And let's do the same thing. So open up the pause menu script. When the options button is pressed, let's just paste those two lines again. So screen transition dot transition, and then we'll await that transition halfway. And let's see if that works. So we're gonna go ahead and open up our game. Let's click options. That takes us to the options. We need to do the same for the back button. But let's go ahead and play open up the pause menu, click options. Okay, so options isn't working, and why is that? So I want you to think, brainstorm for a bit, why do you think that this options is not working? Okay, and the answer is because we did not change the process mode of the screen transition, so it is being affected by the pause state of the scene tree. So we need to just scroll down with the screen transition root node selected and change the process mode to always. Okay, and then while we're here, let's open up the options menu and let's paste those two lines above on the on back pressed method here. So again, these two transition lines and then let's go ahead and try it out. So if I go to my options menu, I can click back. Excellent. So now I'm gonna click play. Now if I open up my...
pause menu and go to options, I should see that working just fine. Excellent. Now, one quick fix is I'm noticing that the main menu vignette is not working yet again. And that's because we need to change the vignette layer to two in the main menu. So now let's run it and everything's good. All right. So I believe we've got all of our transitions in place. Actually, let's try the death screen. So when we click restart from the victory screen or from the end screen here, we need to also do a transition there. So in our on restart button pressed, let's do the screen transition. Oh, this shit is so broken. This tutorial sucks. I gotta watch the whole thing now and just find out what... As the first couple lines in that button. So again, what end screen on restart button pressed. Do those transitions. And then let's do one final test of everything. Make sure it's all good. And now I've got my defeat screen. I'm gonna click restart. And the game is restarted. So yeah, that is screen transitions. Courses. And then I'm going to call this Meta Upgrade. While we're navigating through our UI, there are some abrupt changes between scenes that we want to resolve. And the way that we're going to do this is we're going to use a screen transition. And the screen transition is essentially what you see in a lot of games where there will be like a screen wipe that comes over the screen and then that will transition into a new scene. And that's what we're gonna do because that will mask the abrupt changes between our different scenes 
and just generally make the game feel a lot more solid. So I've attached a texture to this lesson as a resource. It's called screen transition png. So go ahead and grab that, download it and bring it on in to your file system in Godot. And you can drag that screen transition into the assets UI directory. All right, let's create a new scene with a root type of canvas layer. Let's add a color rectangle as our root node or as our first child node. Let's rename this to screen transition. And let's make the color rectangle the full size by changing the anchor preset to full rect from this button up here in the toolbar. All right, let's save this in scenes UI and screen transition is fine. Actually, we don't want to save it here. We want to save it in auto load because this is going to be something that's available to us all the time. So let's go ahead and save that in auto load. All right, so we've got our screen transition. Now we're going to write a shader that will do the transition effect. So select the color rectangle, come on down to the material section, which is near the bottom and select the empty drop down and then new shader material. And then in our shader material here, select the shader resource, create new shader, and just click create when this window comes up and then click into the shader to bring up the shader editor. Now the defaults here are good. We want to define it uniform though. So we're going to say uniform sampler 2D, and this is going to be called transition texture and then put a semicolon at the end. All right, so we've got the shader parameter now, transition texture. Go ahead and grab that screen transition.png and drag it on over. So now that's set as one of our shader parameters here. All right, and what do we wanna do in our fragment shader? Well, what we want to do in the fragment shader is essentially animate this transition over time such that the color rectangle is covering something on screen in accordance with how far we are through the transition. So let's create another uniform. And we're gonna call this uniform float. Let's just call it percent. And then let's do colon, hint range, 0, 0.0 to 1.0. And then don't forget a semicolon at the end. And so now we've got this percent parameter here. So essentially what we're gonna do is this is a grayscale texture, this transition texture. So we're going to compare the texture, let's say red channel to the percent value. And depending on the value of the red channel compared to the percent, we're either going to render the pixel or not. Now, why are we using the red channel? Well, in a grayscale texture, the RGB channels all have the same value. So essentially, we're just using the texture to encode some data and it doesn't really matter what channel we use. We could use R or G or B. Uh, the only one we can't use is alpha because the alpha is always one. So what we're gonna do is we are going to grab the color of the transition texture at the current UV. So we'll say VEC4 transition color is equal to, we're gonna use the texture function. We're gonna pass our transition texture into that and then our UV is gonna be the UV that's coming in for this texture. And then we need a semicolon at the end. So that's grabbing a color from our texture at the same UV as the pixel that we're considering in the color rect for the fragment shader. Again, remember the fragment shader runs for every pixel in a texture. We're essentially getting the corresponding pixel at the transition texture. Now, it's not technically the corresponding pixel because UV coordinates are on a zero to one basis and our transition texture is 256 by 256 and our color rectangle is actually wider and has a different aspect ratio. So it's getting the color of the texture at the UV that corresponds to the UV of the current fragment that we're looking at. Okay, so this will make more sense as we get into it. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say if and then in parentheses, transition color dot R is less than percent. Then we're going to use curly braces because that's what the shader language uses for blocks. Then we're going to say color dot 
a is equal to zero with a colon at the end. Else, and then in the else block, we want to write color is equal to texture, then the constant texture and the constant UV. So we're essentially saying, just use the, co the color of the color rectangle if this is not the case. So now if I move the percent, you can see that we get something really nice looking here. So as we move the percent, it shrinks in and out. Now, when you play with this percent, you'll notice that the edges are very strange. They look kind of bubbly and just not right. And that's because the default filtering that's applied to the texture is, I believe, linear. I could be wrong on the exact filtering, but basically there's different ways of filtering a texture so that you can infer what data is between two pixels. So for instance, if you take a small image and you upscale it, the filtering that you use on that image determines how much new data is created for that image. And with pixel art, we actually don't want any filtering to do. We don't, we don't want our pixel art to look blurry when we upscale it, we want it to look really sharp. And that's the same instance in here. We don't want Godot to infer what data exists when this texture gets stretched. We want it to use the raw pixel data. And so what we need to do in the Uniform Sampler 2D here, our transition texture, we need to add a colon just before the semicolon here, and we need to specify filter nearest to tell it to use nearest filtering, AKA preserve pixels, and let's do this now. So now you can see that we get this nice pixelated edge. Now the dithering or the sort of dots, the empty dots here along the edge are due to the way that I built the texture, but this should actually be just fine. It kind of gives it a retro look. So we're gonna go, we're gonna say that this is fine. And one thing that we need to do is we actually need to invert the if statement. So instead of transition color dot R is less than percent, let's do greater than percent and that inverts it the other way. So you can imagine we'll start at zero for our transition, we'll go all the way to one for the transition, and then we'll come back out for the transition back. Now the thing about applying a shader to a color rectangle is that you will notice that when you change the color of the color rect, that color is not transferred to the shader. And admittedly, I don't know exactly why this is, but we can very easily fix this. So in addition to our transition texture, let's create a new uniform. And this is going to be a VEC4, and we'll call it transition color. And we'll say colon, and then the colon, after the colon, we're gonna say source color. Now that invalidates our variable down here, this VEC4. So we're gonna call this transition texture color and rename it here as well. Okay, and then instead of sampling the texture down here in this else block, we're simply going to say the color is equal to the transition color. Okay, and that's black by default. And so now if we go down to our shader parameters, we can change this transition color to that brown that we use throughout the game, just like that. And that brown hex code is 3F2631, in case you don't have it saved. And so now we've got a nice looking transition texture that we can use. Now we need to animate this. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to add an animation player to the root node here, and I'll move it as the first child. Let's create a new animation and let's call this default. Let's make the duration 0.4 seconds like usual. And let's select our color rectangle. Let's select the animation tab at the bottom and then let's scroll down to our shader parameters and let's keyframe this percent right here. So click on the key button next to the percent shader parameter and click create. And then at the end, let's set the percent to one. So insert a key at the end and change the value to one. And so now if you play it,
you should see that. Let's create an easing value for this. So I'm gonna select the first keyframe and make the easing closer to two. And that just looks much nicer. And you can play the animation. backwards by the way with this button right here this play backwards button and that's how we're going to be using it in engine so we're going to be playing it and then going back Animations on auto run. Why is it so boss?
All right, so that's looking good. Let's create a script for our screen transition here. And let's create. And we're going to want to do one thing that's special here, which is that we're going to create a signal transition halfway. That's going to tell other parts of the code that the transition has fully covered the screen so that we can do things in the background. And you'll see how that works in just a second. So we've got our transitioned halfway. Now let's let's create a method called func transition in. And what we'll do is we'll call animation player dot play default. Actually, let's rename this to transition. So it's just function transition. And then let's create another method here called func emit transitioned halfway. And then in here, we're simply going to do transitioned halfway dot emit. And the reason that we're creating a new function for this is because we're going to call it in the animation player. So let's create a call method track in our animation. So open up that animation panel here, click add track, call method track, double click the root node screen transition, and then go ahead and insert a key, which is emit track. transitioned halfway and drag that on over so that it's at the end. So now when it gets to the end, which is fully covered, it's going to emit that signal, which again will let us know that we can now switch out the scene because this is going to be on top of the window. Now there's something tricky here, which is that that signal is going to be emitted again when we play it backwards. And when are we going to play it backwards? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to await in here. We're going to await transitioned halfway just like so. And then we're going to call animation player dot play backwards default. So it's going to play default, await for that transition signal to be sent, and then it's going to play that animation backwards. One problem we have when we call play backwards is that it's also going to emit this transition halfway signal again, because that's happening at the end of the animation. And that's not exactly what we want to do. So the way that we can fix that is we can simply do the following. We can create a new variable called skip emit, and we'll set that to false. Then in our emit transitioned halfway, we'll say if skip emit, we can set skip emit to false in here, and then we can return. So we'll await the transitioned halfway, and then when that transition is done, we can say skip emit here equals true, and then when this play backwards happens, it's going to get to this block, see that skip emit is true, it's going to reset it, but it's also going to return so we don't so we don't have that transition halfway happening again. So essentially we're just ignoring the second transition halfway signal emission. So with all of that out of the way, now we need to add this as an auto load. But before we do, let's select the root node here and let's set the layer here to something like five so that it renders on top of everything else. And now let's go to project, project settings, auto load. Let's go ahead and load up that scenes, auto load, screen transition .tscn. Go ahead and add that. So now our screen transition is an auto load node. And I'm gonna show you how we can use this. So I'm gonna go open my main menu script here. And so in here, in our on play pressed, we can do screen transition dot transition. So we can call that, which will kick off the transition. Then we'll await screen transition dot transitioned halfway. So we're gonna wait for that to be done. And then we can change our scene to the file. So now if I run my game and I click play, that's not gonna work because let's go back to our screen transition. We got hit by the control node mouse filter. So we need to go to our screen transition, go to the color rectangle here and we need to change the mouse filter mode to ignore. 
Now, it may actually be beneficial to introduce the mouse blocking capabilities of the transition because then that means that we can't do any input while a transition is happening, which may actually be a good thing. So let's leave the mouse filter in place and what we'll do in our animation player is we'll simply set the color rectangle to invisible by default. So let's click this off as visible, so that's now invisible. And when a control node is not visible, it does not accept any mouse events. So we can mark that as invisible with the little eye icon like we did. With our color rectangle selected,
So it never emits. That's basically what's happening. It doesn't emit the second half for whatever reason. Wait, transition halfway. Do I have to put the signal on here? I think maybe this doesn't work because the button is not working in a process. So let's change the way that this functionality works. The freaking... Like a single thing. Open up the enter in place and beneficial to introduce the mouse blocking capability. See the scene, tra so it's scene transition dot transition. This thing runs, and then it waits until scene transition transitioned halfway. an else that may that'll mean it won't like run on top of itself it might be a bit cleaner
because I think they're just wait uh, I also just realized that this is running in ready well just run in ready with the with the chain it should fix it fucking transition doesn't work. Basically the emit transition halfway is not emitting. Halfway emitted. Sometimes it emits and other times it doesn't. So that time got a halfway emit, right? And if I push back, no halfway emit. What's on the debugger now? Meterboard.gd signal press is already connected to a given callable. It's already connected to a given callable. In that object. before before I put the delta in let's see breaks even without the screen let's remove the screen transition because I think that's not even the issue Title is has a, has an issue.
if I had to guess what's happening, the git tree it's setting it to false before it loads this. Item. I'm just trying to do some shader transitions for my game and it's not working. It's like so busted. <laughs> uh, no, Familia is made with RPG Maker. Have you played it? Uh. Thank you for the follow, man, or woman, whatever you are, or it. Something is so funky in this. Transitioned halfway, so if it's screen transition, transitioned halfway. canvas layer that's set as a title screen. That could be breaking it. That's not it, but that is something that's broken. <sighs> God. This is supposed to be easy. It's not doing the thing. Scene transition, and then it runs transition, then it waits for transition to halfway. And it waits for transition halfway. This is all good. Skip emit equals false. I don't know if I want to return. It's better just to do an else, man. Like, it's better from a logic standpoint than do a return. Because this will just keep running forever. bro that works good so basically so with this it's like I'm gonna keep I'm gonna skip emit and then set emit to false and then I'm gonna emit the transition again and then it'll grab it here on the second round so can I just keep going back and forth now so it's like it won't miss it this way Yeah, 
that works great. Holy shit. Dude, I'm so smart. Bro, I am fucking... I am smart, dude. Um, so you kind of came to me at a, a time where... Actually, I don't know. If the mission is halfway, skip the emit. Call it false. And then emit it again. And then run the function again. That really doesn't do anything. This would be the equivalent of just taking it out. Which I could do. I don't know, I'm probably gonna have to finick with this a bit more. But that's the same thing. Right, it's just, practically speaking, it's the same exact functionality. Honestly, it works fine. I gotta fix that one, but yeah. This whole skip emit thing, is it unnecessary? running super clean like if you look at the transitions it's not running extra ones uh, do I have a scene container for control for each scene made in the anim um, do I have a scene container for control oh yeah I have uh, so this is a scene transition node here on canvas layer and it's auto ran, so it's always loaded. And it um, basically the when you run the transitions, it turns them on and off. So he said to do like a thing to make sure you don't do the emit twice, but I think maybe emits don't run twice. Like that's not a thing. So I think the way he had it is like maybe outdated or something. You don't know the node scene. Uh, it's not. It's not. Uh, oh, I see what you're asking now. Uh, the container is a canvas layer node. I thought you were asking like what if I had a dedicated thing to the scene transition. The scene transition is canvas layer. Different ships with different abilities. Yeah, rag. Thanks, dude. I've only been working on it 16 hours a day. I'll I'll up my game though. Okay. Try to deliver on your um on your demands there, bud. <laughs> I could probably push it up to twenty hours a day. I'm slacking. With my full time job, by the way. So I think in this tutorial. Am I on summer vacation? No, I'm just crazy. I'm just stupid. Ask my family. I'm dumb. I'm a ding dong dumbo. <laughs> Who's obsessed with th this game. I mean, I'm not stupid, but I am. I'm very impractical. 
Everyone's like, why don't you get another programming job? You could probably make, you know, $200,000 a year. I'm like, no, I'm going to live off of $10,000 a year and try to make video games all day. Mom, don't tell me what to do. That's... <laughs> I'd have to move back to California, though, if I wanted to get a good job like that. And I kind of don't want to. I have, I like my life. I like working all the time. Hi, LMP. And the work I do is good. I teach kids how to code, so I'm investing in the future of the children of tomorrow. It's kind of a bad investment financially, but it's a good investment societally. Um, and I've kind of come to the conclusion that I don't think I'll be able to sustain a long-term girlfriend unless I get a job like the one I mentioned. they just going to leave eventually, you know what I mean? I can hit it and then, like, move on, but no girl's going to stick around for more than a few months with the way I live my life. Dating, like... Getting a girl and just like hooking up, I think, is easier than it's ever been um, in the history of the United in the history of the world, maybe. But fostering a meaningful long-term relationship is impossible. <laughs> it's like the hardest thing. It's easier to become a millionaire. Six feet, seven figures, dude. You don't have to be tall to get chicks. That's bull. It's just another factor. I'm five seven. I do fine. I mean, it would be a bonus, like it wouldn't hurt my chances, but there are, there are lots of women out there. I'm more like 5'8", if I'm on 5'8", I don't know, 5'7", maybe I shrink, but I'm pretty short, but it also it, it should be stated that in Hawaii people are pretty short in general, so I'm still taller than almost all, than like the majority of women here. It's also, I think, not a cultural value in Hawaii as much as it is in other places that height is important. Um, here we do like martial arts and stuff, so short guys can still kick people's asses. And really, that's the reason why women like men with height, right? It's like a subconscious thing. Like on a very primal level, you'll feel that they will protect you. But if you can do that and you're not tall, you can simulate the same feeling in women, you know? If you're in shape and you can, when you're strong, you can create that effect. Gave up finding love and stuff? I mean, I didn't give up. I just understand that I, the type of women I want, I'm not going to be able to hold on to for a very long amount of time with the way I run my life right now. And I'm okay with it. I think it's good. I think it's, there's power in knowing the reality of the situation. And it's a choice, right? Like, it's not like I couldn't get like a wife. I totally could, but I've made a very intentional choice to run my life in a certain way. And I don't want to drag a woman into this life because while I like the way it goes and I am enjoying it, I don't, um, it would take a really special girl <laughs> to be <laughs> to be a long-term fit with me. They find me um, engaging immediately because I'm charismatic. I'm decently good-looking, even though I'm short, and I'm you know I'm very I have a very relaxing presence. Is what a lot of women tell me is that I help them feel like they feel less anxious around me. Uh, I guess that's a bonus, but it's like. Those qualities, while they will get you a short-term girl, they won't. They don't hang on to them for long periods of time. Women need men who are more financially stable in general. And I'm not, not complaining, again. I'm just saying that these are the choices that I've chosen in my life and the things I've focused on. Robin, you be back still or babysitting? Like Robin, he's got that, he's got that nine to five job. You think his wife would be willing to put up with him if he was not working and working on Godot all day? 
Or Unity in his case. Oh wait, is it your girlfriend? I don't even know. If you're married. But... Yeah. You couldn't get away with the stuff that I get away with. And it's like... I understand that. And I, I think that relationships are beautiful and love is great. But... I also really like doing whatever I want whenever I want every day and every second. Baby maker cannon. <laughs> yeah. Because even if I found a woman who's like a sugar mama, right? Um, which I could do. It would change the dynamic in the relationship if I was the one who... If she paid for most of the stuff. And she would not treat me like I want to be treated. She would not see me as an authority figure. She would try to exert authority over me. Most likely. And... I'm not like against people who have that relationship dynamic in their relationship. But I... I'm not. I don't want that. I don't want no, nobody tell me what to do. So, for me, I find if I date like a richer chick, the thing that happens is I turn into like a servant, and they their expectation is if they're paying for stuff that you'll like do random things for them, clean their car, fix their house, do their roof, shit like that. And I can do something like that for a short short amount of time, but I can't sustain that. Just came back to work from. Bro, you had a three-month paternity leave and you didn't even finish a game, bro? <laughs> Get on it. I guess you had a baby, so that's actually like a real responsibility. Too busy. Yeah. I mean, that's what life's really all about, really. So that's really cool. <laughs> How many more paternity leaves is he gonna have, dude? <laughs> okay, so this actually works pretty well. Um, I'm gonna take a quick break, guys. Uh, if y'all want to watch a video or something, somebody drop a link. I'll probably be gone for like 15 minutes. Uh, I just need to kind of start putting some laundry and some other stuff. Then I'm going to go finish up these transitions. I'm gonna email the guy and be like, and I'm gonna record my screen like super fast. And then I'm gonna send him the video. Start recording, start game. recording let me go grab that video and send it to the guy the sound guy I'm pretty surprised this guy's pretty awesome in, in how willing he's been to help um, contribute to this project I think I am gonna start I'm getting to the point where I'm gonna start probably collaborating more I was against that for a long time because I used to have a small business that I started with some friends and they like corporate takeovered me out of it, you know? And it's one of those things that kind of hurt me emotionally and made me not trust people. But I, but in, in retrospect, the, the thing that I learned is um, you just have to make sure that the outcome is like advantageous if things go awry, right? Like they set it up in a way where if things go awry, I would get screwed and they would be fine, right? And I don't necessarily need to go that extreme, but I will say, recording, start game. So I'm gonna send this video to the guy.
Yeah. Recording, start game. Stop recording. Okay, so I am gonna take a break like I threat threatened to do. I washed my shirt in the sink with bleach and because I got kimchi on it. And I have a to meet a bunch of my kids parents my students parents tonight so I was it's like my nicest shirt and really I have to make sure I look nice for all my kids parents because some of their moms are super hot um, <laughs> you know <laughs> the important things um, but uh, so because of their mom being hot I have to make sure I look really good and my nicest shirt had a stain so I've been actually washing it hand washing it in the sink with bleach Kind of slowly over this morning and now i'm gonna take a shower real fast it'll be like five minutes but i'm gonna rinse the bleach out of the shirt in the shower <laughs> See, i promise i'm not like from the slums of brazil it's just the best way to do it when you're in a pinch having to put i only have like one shirt that i would bleach out of all of my clothes so it's like i don't want to do a whole load just for that freaking one shirt you know i use like black socks colored towels i don't have anything white I don't wear white stuff except for this one nice dress shirt anyway i hope that you enjoyed that story i'll be back in a little bit probably like 15. see you guys in a bit
All right, Maui Game Studio, back in business. How long was I gone? Let's see. I was gone roughly 15 minutes, like I said. Cool, maybe a little bit less. Great, doing good. Okay, so what's broken in my menu? Let's fix it before I gotta go. Leaderboard, this one works freaking fantastic. Um, options, does not work. So let me check the closing of the options. Uh, this will be in the title screen. On options closed. Instance queue free. You know, I don't really want this transition on options. I'll maybe figure out my own transition later. But I think it's fine just to pop up. Um, I'll do an animation at a later point, but... Oh, it still has the closed transition. I don't want that. So let's get rid of that. Since it's in the same scene, you know. Um, recording, start game. closing I don't want that transition there I like the transition for the pause menu. So we're gonna remove that. I think it's it's not good because it's like it adds time that you have that transition going where you can't play. So we're gonna go into pause menu and I'm gonna remove all of the transitions. Except for the quit to screen button, we'll leave that one. I guess there was only one. So now Bro, it works freaking great. So for start game, if you pause it, you 
can either push escape or you push start on your controller. Um, this just closes, but this does the transition. Bro, it's freaking sweet, dude! How sweet is that menu, bro? Thing is tight. And I'm just gonna do the next thing in the, uh, there's a meta progression section, which meta upgrades meta underscore upgrades and before we do any code in the meta progression let's create a script under meta upgrades so right click new script and call it meta underscore upgrade dot gd let me start from the beginning so meta upgrades um this next section i've been looking forward to because currently the game it doesn't really you can't really progress. Um, so what I'm hoping these next two chapters will do is they actually increase what you can do for upgrades as you go. So I think by Friday, I could pretty much have everything other than the, um, other than the networking stuff done. So that's really exciting. You can hear me, right? Yeah. Okay, it is going. Now that our game is in pretty good shape visually and gameplay wise, there's one final mechanic that I want to add into the game, and that is meta progression. Most games in this genre have some way to collect permanent upgrades based on what you're accomplishing in the game, and those permanent upgrades can affect every subsequent run. And so I'm going to walk you through the process of building out a framework that you can use to implement however many upgrades you want, and also how to save and load that data from the disk so that it persists in between gameplay sessions. So the first thing that we're going to want to do is let's just set up the code for supporting meta upgrades. So the best place to put this is going to be in a singleton. And that means that we can reference that data from anywhere in the code 
but also it's going to allow us to save and load the files at any point during the game, whether we're in the game or in the options menu or at the main menu, whatever is necessary. So once we've got the code in place, we'll go through the process of saving the data and loading it from the disk, and then we'll build a UI so that the player can actually put points into that progression. So let's go ahead and create a new node, and we're gonna create a root node of type node, and then let's call it meta manager, or let's call it meta pro progression. Like I was putting it from the disk, and then we'll build a UI so that the player can actually put points into that progression. So let's go ahead and create a new node, and we're gonna create a root node of type node, and then let's call it meta manager, or let's call it meta pro progression, like I was describing it. And then let's do scenes and then auto load, we'll save it in there. Let's go ahead and add a script to this meta progression. And what is our data gonna look like? Manager, or let's call it meta pro progression, like I was describing it. And then let's do scenes and then auto load, we'll save it in there. Let's go ahead and add a script to this meta progression. And what is our data gonna look like? Well, I think we're going to pretty much use the same strategy as what we have for our ability upgrades. So I'm going to create a new folder under resources. And then I'm gonna call this meta upgrades, meta underscore upgrades. And before we do any code in the meta progression, let's create a script under meta upgrades. So right click new script and call it meta underscore upgrade dot GD. Okay, and then let's go ahead and open up that meta upgrade. Grade. And this needs to extend resource, same as what we were doing with our ability upgrades here. And then what we're gonna do is we're going to add an export variable and we're gonna give this an ID again. So this is gonna be ID string. Then let's export another variable called max quantity and that will be an int. And let's set this to one by default. And then let's give it a title, var title string and then and let's do export underscore multi-line var description string. Okay, so what are some, what is one upgrade that we can add for the player? And because our game is not full of content, there's not really anything too creative we can do yet. But I think one obvious thing that we can do is increase the drop rate of experience, right? So that the player can get upgrades faster. And I'm not really paying attention too much to balancing this game. Balancing is a whole other can of worms that takes a lot of time to get through. I'm just trying to show you throughout this course how you can approach adding new things. It doesn't necessarily mean that those new things we're adding are going to be balanced or good for the game. So let's go ahead and create a new resource under the meta upgrade. So right click that folder, new resource, and then let's go ahead and add a base type resource here and let's call it, let's call it experience underscore gain. All right, double click that experience gain and then drag underscore. I click that folder, new resource, and then let's go ahead and add a base type resource here. And let's call it, let's call it experience underscore gain. All right, double click that experience gain and then drag the meta upgrade into the script and you should see all of the IDs here. Now I'm gonna write experience gain in the ID here. Max quantity can stay. a base type resource here and let's call it let's call it experience underscore gain all right 
double click that experience gain, and then drag the meta upgrade into the script and you should see all of the IDs here. Now I'm gonna write experience gain in the ID here. Max quantity can stay at one. Let's call the title increase experience. And then let's do increases experience drop chance by 10%. Okay, so that's a very basic upgrade that we can have. So we've got our one upgrade set up here. Let's go back to the meta progression script and let's do a little bit of planning about how our save data is gonna look. So I'm gonna create a new variable called meta upgrades. Then this is going to be a type of dictionary. And the way that I'm gonna set this is I'm gonna set it equal to an empty dictionary, but just for demonstration purposes, I think what's gonna happen is we're going to have the ID here, so it's gonna look like something like experience gain, just like that. And then there's gonna be a sub dictionary here, and there's going to be a quantity, which is gonna be one or something similar. And the reason why- I'm tripping out right now. I didn't realize he was gonna do data databases, like uh, saved stuff in this tutorial. I thought the meta progression was gonna be something else. Pretty awesome. So for the leaderboards, I can just do total experience gained. <laughs> and that'll be like a lot of fun. Yeah, for sure. So I was gonna do like, just you play my game, right? And um, whoever gets the highest score gets the highest. And I can still do that fairly, relatively easily. But now I can also do an experience gain leaderboard. So whoever just gains the most experience will be like the coolest. And they get to get the cool points by being the, the most neckbeard about it. I'm really hungry. I'm debating cutting the stream early and going and getting food. I was going to wait another hour and then get food after I was done. <sighs> There's no time to get food. Uh, you know, I have to wait anyway, because I have to wait for my shirt to dry. Oh, my phone's ringing. One sec. Oh. Don't want to answer that now. <laughs> okay. Um... Hmm. Do I have any food here? I don't think so. Yeah, I'm just gonna hang out another hour. I can handle it. Rah, just keep going. Use the pain to fuel my fury. I like to do nested dictionaries is because imagine you're building this as a full game and you have some other data that you want to associate with the experience gain. If you just had, let's say the experience gain set to one right there, you would have a hard time associating more data with it. Whereas if you had just a sub dictionary, you can add any number of additional properties under here that you want. So for instance, let's say that I wanted to tell the player when they picked up this ability. I could say acquired timestamp, right? And then this could be some kind of number. So that's kind of what I'm gonna set it up as. So the currency that's going to be used for these upgrades is going to be the total amount of experience that you've collected. So in addition to experience leveling you up in the game, that's gonna get added to a number in the meta upgrades. So 
actually what we're going to want to do is something like, let's just call this currency. We'll call it upgrade currency, like so. And this will be something like zero. And then I'm gonna have another key underneath it called upgrades. And in this upgrades dictionary, that's where you're going to see things like experience gain. So it's really important to plan out what you want your data to look like. And so now we've got a top level, which can tell us things about the player's progression. And we might be able And this is making me realize I actually kind of like the strict white spacing approach. Because it's like, all these freaking brackets just get kind of crazy. Even able to store more data in here, like we could say win count, right? And then loss count. And then we can also store the upgrade currency and the current upgrades, right? And let's call this meta upgrades and meta upgrade currency. To be very specific. So if we initialize our dictionary like this, now the data is becoming very clear, right? We can add more top level unrelated stats to this as part of the save file. And then we have a very specific key that keeps track of all of the experience. So this is the beauty of dictionaries is that you can store arbitrary nested data very sensibly. But I'm gonna get rid of this win count and loss count and just keep it like this. And then I'm probably going to, yeah, let's just remove the experience gain here. And so this is my stubbed out data. And we can actually leave it like this as well as the initialized version of the data. All right, so we've got our meta upgrades now. Let's go ahead and increment this meta upgrade currency whenever the experience is increased. Now, fortunately, we have in our game events, we have this experience vial collect. Uh, what, 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 um, database tools did you use again, Monkey King? That's definitely going to be something in the future, because I'm realizing now, with this meta upgrade stuff, I can save your exp Like, I'll have a leaderboard, but there's more that I can put on there, so... I didn't realize this tutorial included a form of leveling up. That's, like, bonkers to me. <laughs> it's so much stuff. Um, so... It's going full RPG all of a sudden. Like my brain is like blowing up with the possibilities. I forget what it's called. Is it free? right and we can actually listen to that in our meta progression let's go currency whenever the experience is increased now fortunately we have in our game events we have this experience vial collected right and we can actually listen to that in our meta progression Let's go to our project, project settings, auto load. One thing that we need to do before we can do that is we need to add that meta progression to our auto load. So let's go ahead and click this load button, go to scenes, auto load, 
and go ahead and put in the metaprogression.tscn, click add, and then close. So now, since that's in the scene tree, this meta progression, we can in our ready method, so let's do func ready, we're going to say game events dot experience file collected dot connect, and we're gonna say on experience collected is the function name. And then let's go down and do the same thing. So func on experience collected. All right, so in here, what we want to do is we want to, first of all, the number comes in as an argument here. So let's specify that. And then we can say meta upgrades and then the index, which is meta upgrade currency. We're going to say plus equals number. So now we're just constantly keeping track of the experience that was collected. OK, now let's stub out another function. Func add meta upgrade. And we're going to pass in the upgrade, which is of type. And let's go ahead and give our meta upgrade script. So go ahead and open up meta up function. supports it, I would say no SQL or SQL Lite. Um, I'm probably going to use JSON since I'm pretty committed to using Firebase. Uh, and that the integration for JSON files is pretty good. Uh, oh, you're saying... Oh, for the... To edit, to edit JSON uh, database files, you're saying to use no SQL or SQL Lite? Is that what you're saying? I thought those are like, that doesn't sound right. Aren't those like not for database implementation? Well, we'll be getting into it more on my stream, but um, yeah, I'm definitely gonna, I didn't realize this had this feature. I mean, I guess it's a survivor's feature. When I was looking at the tutorial and he said meta progression, I assumed that was just like when you get a certain score, it does something different, right? Uh, which already existed, but I thought by meta progression, what he meant in, in when I was looking at like the syllabus for this course was that it would just be like, um, you know, once you hit a thousand, then there's like additional stuff you can do in an experience. Like I thought it was going to purely be an arcade game. I didn't think, I believe there's a plugin for it. Yeah. Yeah, we'll get to that. Um, I'm trying to finish up the tutorial, so. Yeah, iOS uses core data or Realm, but should use SQLite. Um, but I think you should only use them when the dictionary or database gets really large. Yeah, I might. I can probably honestly just save these uh, JSON, the, the GD files right on the server. So there's always that, you know. I can save the actual format of Godot. But, you know, I'll figure it out as time goes on. Once I finish the tutorial, then I'll have an idea of all of the things that he teaches you how to do, and then I can look up other stuff. But you plan on using Firebase real-time database? Yeah, something like that, yeah. Or Firestore, I don't know. I'm kind of, I need to figure that out, so. Um, I like Firebase's Google integration because I'm mainly an Android guy, so I want it to be like integrated to where you can just easily get connected to your Google account. <clears throat> I think they do offer an Apple ID integration as well. I don't know off the top of my head. I think so. But um, it costs money too, so it would be like can just post it with HTTP request yeah yeah that's a head that's a little bit ahead of where I am now but yes doing this meta progression stuff will help me get a little bit more comfortable with the way Godot handles databases and databases in general 
since it's storing data and then moving it around it's like similar you know but the the possibilities are endless base while real time is real time yes yes so it uh monkey king yeah that's true. So for a game where you have meta progression, if you were saving your meta progression, I would say you would probably use um, real time database. Uh, but if you're just saving like leaderboards, uh, it makes sense to, to, to store in Firestore. But I don't know. It, 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 there's some crossover. So I don't I don't really know what I'm going to do um, in that regard. I'll figure it out. I think for me, I'm more familiar with Firestore. So setting up something at least initially and then maybe tweaking, um, trying to do the real time stuff later uh, would be good. And I'm not that familiar, so I don't know, but I'm more familiar with Firestar. I've never used data. So I don't know, it's just, I gotta try it out. I, I can't commit to either at this point, but um, yeah, all good, good feedback though, like good ideas. I, I appreciate it too, because a lot of time chat, they just wanna like, be like you should add a mothership or something and i'm like bro that's like so much scope but you guys are actually discussing the things that are just right around the horizon like within the next few days i'll be doing that implementation um you should add a fathership <laughs> yeah typical twitch chat and game dev streams bro you know this game would be really cool if you added zombies <laughs> Where's the waifus? <laughs> Need more wa- I mean, I agree with that suggestion if somebody were to say that, but it's just, it's also a stupid thing to say, despite being true. You know, you can, you can say things that are true. My ne I remember I was talking to my nephew and some of the wisdom I gave to him, I was, he said, I gotta, s he's like, uncle, I just gotta say the truth. And I was like, it is good to say things that are true. And you definitely don't want to say things that are untrue. But you know what's better than saying things that are true? Saying things that are smart. It's always better to say something smart than to say something true. And I, I live by that mantra. Because I say stupid shit all the time, so I have to keep telling myself in my head. It's better to say something smart than to say something true. And by smart, I don't mean like smart ass. I mean like, it's better to say something that will achieve the objectives that are intended to be achieved. And that's not necessarily the same as saying something is true. True is a lot of things like, leaves are green. You know, you're not lying, but why the fuck are you talking about that, you idiot? <laughs> you know, like, shut up. <laughs> It's better to say things that are smart. Leaves are green, only green on earth. Yeah, see that's neither smart nor true. See, that's a great example. <laughs> you can be both. It is true. I don't know. I'm pretty sure there's some plants on space, bro. You don't think they have any plants in the space station? In their labs? See, not true. Fake news. Leaves get their color from the spectrum of light that hits them. Okay, this is getting... It, it's going from sounding s stupid to sounding smart. Are leaves green in space? Plants might not be green in other planets. But I want to know about space stations. Look! These are the green leaves in space! Look at these zero-G leaves.
Oh, so you're saying the leaves are only green in our solar system? Well, then it's not just our planet then. Okay. LMP. This is actually a very interesting... I never really thought about that. Like, if you have a different star and a different atmosphere, you'll have a different color leaf. But these plants are still green. Despite being grown in... Uh, it looks... It appears as if they're grown hydroponically with lights. But I guess we probably designed the lights in a certain way, right? To make them green? I don't know. Very interesting. But there are green plants in space. Funk, add meta upgrade. And we're gonna pass in the upgrade, which is of type. And let's go ahead and give our meta upgrade script. So go ahead and open up meta upgrade.gd. Give it a class name of meta up. Grade. So class name, meta upgrade, like so. And then let's go back to our meta progression and let's make this type in here, type of meta upgrade. So now what we're gonna do is we are going to do the following. We're going to say if meta up grades <laughs> and then meta upgrades. Let's uh, let's change this. So this meta upgrades right here, this variable, let's change it to save underscore data because that's a little bit more descriptive of what we're doing with this. And then let's change it here, save data, and let's change it in this on experience collected as well. Okay, so if save data meta upgrades, so that's this key right here, dot has, and then in here, we want to say upgrade dot ID, and let's actually invert this. So we'll say if not, which you can use the not word or you can use exclamation mark. If not save data has upgrade ID, then what we're gonna do is we're going to say save data and then index meta upgrades and then index upgrade dot ID is equal to, and then let's go ahead and set a default quantity of zero. So what is this doing? What this is saying is that if we don't yet have an entry for the upgrade that we're passing in, then what we're gonna do is we're going to set that entry to have a default value of quantity zero. So that means that essentially after we add the experience upgrade or experience gain upgrade, it's gonna look like this. Experience gain, and then it's going to have an object like so. So that's what we're creating if it does, and we're gonna say on experience. Scenes, auto load, and go ahead and put in the meta progression.tscn, click add, and then close. So now, since that's in the ready we're going to say game events dot experience file collected dot connect and we're going to go down and select it comes in as an is meta upgrade and we're going to pass in in the upgrade which is of type and let's go ahead and give our where's the number our meta upgrade script so go ahead and open up meta upgrade dot 
GD, give it a class name of meta upgrade. So class name, meta upgrade, like so. And then let's go back to our meta progression oh, oh. and let's make this type in here, type of meta upgrade. So now what we're gonna do is we are going to do the following. We're going to say if oh, I see. meta upgrades and then meta upgrades. Let's uh, let's change this. So this meta upgrades right here, this variable, let's change it to save underscore data because that's a little bit more descriptive. of what we're doing with this. And then let's change it here, save data. Oh. And let's change it in this on experience collected as well. Okay, so if save data meta upgrades, so that's this key right here, dot has, and then in here, we want to say upgrade dot ID. And let's actually invert this. So we'll say if not, which you can use the not word or you can use exclamation mark. If not save data has upgrade ID, then what we're gonna do is we're going to say save data and then index meta upgrades and then index upgrade.id is equal to, and then let's go ahead and set a default quantity of zero. So what is this doing? What this is saying is that if we don't yet have an entry for the upgrade that we're passing in, then what we're going to do is we're going to set Set that entry to have a default value of quantity zero. So that means that essentially after we add the experience upgrade or experience gain upgrade, it's going to look like this. Experience gain, and then it's going to have an object like so. So that's what we're creating if it doesn't exist. And then what we can do is since we are now guaranteed that this save data has that upgrade within the meta upgrades, we can say save underscore data meta upgrades and then upgrade.id, 
and then quantity plus equals one. So do you see what we're doing there? We are now referencing that quantity and increasing it. There it is, that's the issue right there. Okay, so now we can do the save data. Now you might be saying, well, why don't we just say it, do it here? Because this will work every single time. It, it's not conditional, right? In here, it's conditional. So if we set the quantity to one, then we'd have to return out of the function. It just makes more sense to set up the initial empty object or the initial object structure. Be right back, I gotta put my phone on the charger because I gotta leave in like 20 minutes. Anybody we know streaming? I might just go ahead and finish this offline first and then always add one to it rather than deal with the other conditionality. Okay, so after we add the meta upgrade, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm going to print that save data just for just for debugging purposes. And then in the ready method, let's go ahead and test it. Let's do add meta upgrade. And then we're going to do a, let's say load res experience gain. So we're loading this path. Res resources, meta upgrade. Six. 
experience gain. And so as soon as we run the game, what we should see is we should see our dictionary printed. And you can see that's exactly as we expected, right? We have no upgrade currency. We have no, we have one meta upgrade with a quantity of one. So that's all working. So I'm gonna go ahead and remove that code uh, because we don't need that. And I'll remove the print as well because we verified that that is working. All right, so that's our data setup. In the next lesson, we're going to set up saving and loading that data from the disk. Okay. Let's get our... I don't know if I'll... He has a seven minute video next. I think I'm gonna go ahead and just find someone to raid and hang out in their chat. So twitch.tv, let's see who's on. <clears throat> oh, Risey's on. We're gonna go Risey. I said, a big saddie saddie, but I get new frog. Now I hoppy hoppy with it. Oof, I step on. Bro, that. Okay. Oh, that's a whole TTS right there. All right, everybody, we're going to go hang out with Risey. She messaged me and said that she was going to raid me yesterday, but I was AFK, basically scolding me. I want you to ask her when you, when you see her in the chat. Who the hell does she think she is? All right. Who, who oh, the hell? This is at negative twelve. Who the hell does right she now. think she is talking um, to me like that? That's what I'd like to know. Anyway. And it's not. Uh, let's go ahead and raid her and say hi. And by the way, for those of you who don't understand okay. the nuance, I'm joking. Okay. Bye. Is the position is negative twelve? Their ammo for that? Oh man. Practical. No. No, why are you doing this to me? <laughs> Bruh, Nano. God damn it, guys. Yo, Spambot, welcome back. Uh, Maui, for the love of God. <laughs> oh, no, guys. <laughs> guys. I'm supposed to rude. <laughs> this is not. This is not allowed.